bring this about in a change from the Gospel of Luke with our business meeting right after service today. So the message has been titled, Faith, Promise, Missions. Faith, Promise, Missions. And I really want to um, just read this passage rather quickly, and then I'm going to have you participate in the passage with me after I read the verses to kind of get you an idea of the flow of what Isaiah is teaching us. So Isaiah chapter 12, and we begin reading in verse number four, where it says, And you will say, In that day give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, proclaim that his name is exalted. Isn't that what it's about? It's his name, amen? Sing praises, verse 5 says, to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. And so we're seeing here where it says in verse 4 to proclaim that his name is exalted. In verse 5, let this be made known in all the earth. So there's two quick connect commands there. Now I'd like for you to stand with me and we're going to read the whole psalm. Isaiah is full of prophecies. The whole, it is a psalm, but it's Isaiah 12. So if y'all wouldn't mind standing and you're going to do some responsive reading just like they used to do in the old reformed churches back in the day. So how we're gonna do it is this, what you see in green, it is you reading, and what is in white is what I will be reading, okay? You don't have to read that parentheses where it says oh, responsive oh. reading, okay? Uh, teleprompter, we just sometimes have hints, so don't worry about that. Isaiah chapter 12, verse 1 to 6. You will say in that day, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, that you might comfort me. Verse 2. Behold, God is my salvation. And I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song. Amen. And he has become my salvation. With joy he will draw water from the wells of salvation. Isn't that beautiful? Then the passage that we read that is for our text today, the message, and you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord. Let this be made known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy. O inhabitant of Zion. For great in your midst is the Holy One. God had his richest blessings on the reading of this song in the uh, 12th chapter of Isaiah. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we're thankful for this time. And Lord, as we have offered uh, praise and worship to you to sing about the name of your son and you being his father and the spirit that is indwelling in us, the leader of all things around that happens to us and inside of us. Lord, that is your trinity. And we pray, Father, that we will always bring honor and glory to the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. For we surely sing, see this in this wonderful, wonderful song that Isaiah recorded by your word and by your will. Lord, may we understand that the day that we're living in, people all around us, need Jesus Christ as Savior, and that we have the opportunity, that we are the hope, we are the Christians, the little messiahs in this world, and it is the only thing that matters. So Lord, as we bring about the Word of God and understanding that it is our job to point the way to Messiah, we ask, Lord, that as we conclude this message and we have our 
business meeting, everything said and done will be for, be for that honor and for that glory. That the name of the, of the Lord will be gloriously proclaimed and that we will shout and sing because of his blessings. Even in times of trouble, even in times of persecution, may we see this and bring honor and glory to you. For it's in your name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As we said, we've brought the message, faith, promise, missions. And that's what really we're going to be talking about here in the next few minutes when we start our business meeting. It is that we are to take the promises of God and by faith enact them in the ministry around here, in our neighborhoods, in our spheres of influence, but then ultimately to the world beyond. That's what God's called us to do. So when you look at this song, it's in the middle of a book that brings amazing prophecies. When you look at chapter 11, it's all about the Messiah. When you see chapter 12, it's all about praising the Messiah who will come and bring the kingdom. And we long for that day. Just as the people who were surrendering to God right when they were going into captivity in Isaiah's message. Because the kingdom was in a sense lost at that time because of the ungodliness of the people of Israel. So when it says in verse 4, you say in that day, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name. Here's what's interesting. They were supposed to be given that message all around the world, but because of their sin, they weren't doing it. And as a result, they got deposed to the empire of the world, the first great empire, not Egypt, but Babylon. And as a result, on the shores in the capital of Babylon, they began to proclaim the name of the Lord. And that's where we can go from Isaiah to the three Hebrew ch children, Daniel being the leader of them. But it says here, to make known his deeds among the peoples, proclaim that his name is exalted. What has happened in the New Testament church is that we have become so involved with ourselves and with what church practice is supposed to be about, we let the world go to hell. And as a result, our message has not been. We must get back to proclaiming the name, which really goes into singing praises to the Lord, being spirit-filled so that his glory will be made known all around the earth. That's what God's called us to do. We know this. And the only way we have to do this is by faith. And it's enacting the promises that God has called us to this mission to do. How much did we just do this message, mission from last Sunday? How many times did we proclaim the name of the Lord gloriously? Did we praise him in front of other people who do not know him? Let me tell you something. After they got deposed to the reign and terror of King Nebuchadnezzar, and they were in prison, and they were enslaved, they started proclaiming his name then. So much that it had an effect to eventually, after about 14 years, the most wicked man in the world, Nebuchadnezzar, proclaimed God, the God of all gods. Now he had help because of Daniel and the, and the, the um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but he also saw this people begin to proclaim the name of the Lord. Are we going to have to go through that? It's possible. We surely see this coming about. If one thing we know, there's one thing that's hated more than anything else. It's those who follow this book. And that's happening. And that's why we see so many people falling by the wayside. But God wants us more than anything else to be the witness and testimony, even in a place like Capstone Baptist Church, that could be the smallest of all gatherings ever. We're right here. We're living proof of that. And that's what I want you guys to see. That's us right there. That's not a mustard seed. That is a seed to the biggest trees 
the largest and oldest trees on planet Earth. That is a redwood tree from out sea out of California. About three years ago, we got to see that when my son got married, I didn't want to go, but I can tell you that they had the altar where I performed the marriage ceremony. We just celebrated the birth of their daughter last Sunday, but last Saturday, but I want you to know that I complained all about why we got trees here in, in Leander. We got, we got shrub oaks, we got cedar, and boy was I wrong because we were at a tree that was over 2,000 years old before the coming of the baby Jesus, and it was 80 foot in circumference. And that's where we performed the wedding, under a canopy of these redwood cypress trees all through that park. 45 degrees, raining, and it was as dry as a bone underneath those trees coming off of that ocean. Now, look how big that seat is. I would suggest to you, that's Capstone Baptist Church right there. <laughs> and that when God plants us as a church, we may never see it, but as he tarries and his kingdom does come, we can be that redwood. That's what he wants. And that's the amazing thing, that these things are still going to live for hundreds of years more. That's the power of what God can do in his creation. If he can do that in his physical creation, what more can he do in his spiritual creation? Everyone here claims to be born again. Everyone here has the creator of the universe inside them. You must remember Genesis 1-1 when it says that the spirit moved upon the waters. That's the same spirit that's inside you. So it is not difficult to see this. Now, the classic example here is the mustard seed. Jesus was speaking to the disciples in Matthew 17, verse 20. He says to them, because of your little faith, for truly I say to you, if you have faith like the grain of a mustard seed, you will say to that mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Did you know that the disciples never moved a mountain? No, they moved the world. The moving of the mountain was an expression. It was a Jewish idiom that meant that only the power of God could do that. And it happened by the time they get to Acts chapter 12, it says that you men have turned the world upside down with your gospel. And that's what's happened. Now we're living in times that people want to say it's the end times and that everything's going bad and it's just terrible. And I can surely say that I've gone through that before. But I'm here to say to you that God may still be wanting to plant redwood seeds or even a mustard seed here right. that can make that tree house, house, Jesus goes on to say, thousands of birds. And the impact that has to happen here is that we take that little bit of faith and we plant them in the leading of the Holy Spirit in the form of a gospel in people's hearts. And we let God do his work, not our work. We're living in a day that has to look beyond the here and now and what we see in the landscape of this country and even around the world. And what we need to see is the world as it truly is. And I'm going to show you that. I want you guys to see this. This is a map of the world. And these areas here are the most populated areas in the world between the Middle East, India, and the Far East, you have the largest concentration, literally the largest concentration of lost people. Each red dot means there is no gospel witness. And I'm challenging us to look beyond our Jerusalem and to look to the areas that need the gospel the most. Now, I will say, and it can be made an argument, especially when we look at our 30-year-old people on down in this country, there is a mission field. And we're going to show you that in just a minute. 
But the mission field that God's concerned around is the 8 billion people that literally over 2 million people have, it can be argued, have not heard the name Jesus Christ, even with all the technology that we have. They may have heard a form of it, but they have not been given the actual answer of Jesus Christ and who he is. And I know this because of the statistics that are being bore out. The unreached groups, there are 100 that have groups that can fill nations. We're talking up to and more than 2 billion people around the world have not got one gospel witness. It is total, total darkness. Obviously, your Arab world, but it's not just the Arab world. It's not just the communist world. It's not just the Middle East or the Far East or the region of India, which is over a billion people itself. It is, if you look at this last line, 1.8 billion people, 23% of the world has not one shred of light of gospel. If a Bible comes across their path and they're in touch with it, they can die. And I get these statistics, and I've invited you to go there and look at this. It's called the Joshua Project. The Joshua Project will send you a member of each 100 people group so you can pray for them every day. And they send it to you into your folder of your email so that you can pray. This one here is in Afghanistan, a population of almost 12 million people. And there's the website. And they will send it right to your email so that you can pray for them that God will have his glory declared upon the nations. If you and I were to go there and present the gospel directly, we would be in prison or killed. There are people that are there who are trying to do it in a way through humanitarian reasons. But now, especially since the um, uh, warlords have taken back over, it is very dark. But that's 12 million people. That's just one of these hundred groups that are there. And it gives this information. It gives you a point to where you can investigate even more and pray for even contacts who are trying to get in there. That's important for us. It is to be prepared. We may not be able to support missions through all around the world because of what little bit of seed faith that we have, but we can surely bring it to the Lord in prayer for these people that they might get saved. That's so important. It's called the 1040 window. And that's the area where there are more population than anywhere. And the red dots within that area is the area that there is no gospel. And if you look at India, I just want y'all to look at India. Right here. That's the most concentrated area. I think that's important. So I want y'all to catch this. Have y'all been noticing there's a lot of construction going around here and a lot of stores being built? Mm -hmm. And restaurants? Have y'all been noticing the Indian restaurants that are being built in this area? I can name you three stores between here and 1431 that are Indian stores being built right now. One right by my house that looks like it's going to be almost as big as the HEB. It's not necessary that we have to go out to the world. The world has come to us. Do you all understand that? This green is very dark right here. The green right here that I'm pointing to in the 1040 window is an abnormality. It's darker than any of the green in this country. What country is that one over there? It's way greener, this little area. That area that I just pointed to is an Asian country called Korea. And Daniel Wittenden is our missionary to Korea who's working in Seoul today. She's already had her services that they're trying to have church and coffee shops. And we're gonna have a business meeting and talk about what we can do to help her in that area in the next few minutes. Now, it could be argued that that is so green, why do we need Danielle over there? 
And I invite you to go back to a year and a half ago. You can go to the to the my YouTube page and listen to her testimony, and she will tell you why. Because very similar to here, the 30-year-old crowd has rejected the denominationalism of Korea, and she sees Korea on a downward spiral. It was her desire, by the way, to go more into China, but she was stopped in it. So she's there in Korea now, working with a group in Seoul to do this. Of course, we see a lot of this in Africa, it's sparsely populated. New Zealand has a lot of gospel there, not as much in, in, in Australia. But all around this world, when you go into the Middle East over here, it may not look like much in the red like India, because it doesn't have quite the population with 30-some uh, Arab nations all around Israel, but I promise you, they are very dark. And this statistic gets updated weekly by their agents they are doing this. And so I invite you to go into the Joshua Project and look at that website. You can spend hours there and learn where the need is. Because if, let me tell you something. When you focus on someone else's problems, it makes us see our problems that much more easier. Now, on July, the, the last Sunday in June, I asked you to preach right before... We preached on the uh, 4th of July Sunday message that I had right before the 4th. I asked you to read 2 Corinthians 8, 9, and 10. I won't ask anybody to raise hands. It's been a few weeks since then. It's been three weeks. Didn't we do that? Because I'm telling you something, that's where you can catch the vision of God's heart. And I believe that the blessings that can happen to Capstone that this church will happen when we begin to be concerned for the souls of the people who need the Lord around the world. Hmm. He's called for us to have a mission's heart. Our father was the first missionary when he sent his son. And that's what the church grabbed hold of. And at different times, many times because of persecution, chapter 8, chapter 9 was the persecution of the Jewish leaders by Saul, who became Paul the Apostle later, but they scattered around the Middle East, giving the gospel out, and all the way down to, as far as Ethiopia. We know that for sure. But it took persecution. It may have to take that now for us to get the gospel out as the Lord tarries. And we need to be okay with it. Let me tell you what we're doing with our seeds. This is what we're doing. We're like a bunch of birds trying to steal it from some other animal. They aren't, they're not supposed to be doing that. We get mad and yell at them, and we start fighting, trying to get our little seed. And I see it every day while I'm outside working. These birds go after it. And the squirrels, ooh, 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 they love to tease them. And that war that goes on between them is like, we're doing the exact same thing. I want your little seed. Give me it. It's mine, it's mine, it's mine. And we end up fighting and squabbling. Well, this group's doing it wrong. Well, this group's doing it wrong. They need to give it to us because we know how to do it. We're just like these animals. But all it takes is for us to take our little seed and begin to pray with the watering of the Holy Spirit and put it in the good ground of the Word of God and then let God fertilize it, make it whole and complete, and it springs up. More than a mustard seed, more than a mustard tree, or bush, really, all the way to a bedwood. And we can do this if God will allow us to quit squabbling and fighting and pushing and trying to get power struggles. The church can be the church because that song we sang, Build Your Kingdom Here, it's very true. We are the hope for the world because they're going to see Jesus by the way that they see us acting. And this is what they see as us acting over our little seeds. God help us. If I'm lying, I'm dying. Am I wrong? Do, am I just whistling in the wind? No, this is what's happening. And we all complain about all the stuff that's going around when we're fighting with each other. We're fighting with other groups that name the name. Stop. 
begin to accentuate the positive. And the positive is that the word of God sent by the Holy Spirit and planted into a heart breathes new life. And that's all it takes. Now, how are we going to do it? I want you to sit in note takers. I'm going to need you to take a few notes on this in a few, few minutes that we have required. I'm going to start not in 2 Corinthians. I want to start in 1 Corinthians because this is key. Okay? I want y'all to notice the first few words of 1 Corinthians. This is the last chapter of 1 Corinthians. And some see, even have said that this is actually a second book that was added into it. I don't believe it. I think it's 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. And that's it. But look at the first verse there. Now concerning the collection for the saints. Oh, here comes the pastor. He's going to talk about money. No, this is Paul talking about money. As I directed the churches of Galatia, so also are you to do. Verse 2 is so important, okay? I want y'all to see this. On the first day of every week. The first day of every week. Now I want y'all to say that back with me. The first day of every week. Say it again. The first day of every week. The first day of every week. One more time. The first day of every week. Well, you got to do it twice. You got to do a little bit better than that. The first, the first day, day of every week. week. The first day of the week is Monday, right? No. It's not Monday? No. When's the first day of the week, Sally? It's Sunday. It's Sunday. You are to bring a collection for the saints. Now, it doesn't say a collection for the lost. Now, we're going to tell you what that meant. The saints were the saints of Jerusalem, and this was a special offering they were beginning because they were having a famine in the Middle East. And in Acts chapter 15, the apostles that were there in Jerusalem told Paul that all these Gentile churches, they need to support the mother church because we're dying from lack of food. And over around all the way to Greece, where Corinth was at, and Asia Minor, they're having plenty of food and plenty of water. Take an offering and bring us food and money so that we can buy food. And they were doing that. All the churches were very good. The Philippian church was the best, Paul said. Guess who the worst church was? The, the Corinthian church. They made a promise of how much they were going to give. And they hadn't collected it yet. And when you meet for church on what day of the week? That's three times in the, in the New Testament said that that's when the saints met. There's no command to do it. It says that's what they did because it was a resurrection day, right? First day of the week is when Jesus got, got up out of that grave. Amen. And that's why they did this. So they were to bring that offering. And all the churches were doing it. Paul commended them. And he said that the church in Philippi was doing it better. But they didn't have as much money as you do, Corinthians. And you haven't gave anything yet. So look at verse 2 again. On the first day of the week, each of you put of you is to put something aside and store it up. I want you all to key on that word store. Write that somewhere. Put it on your forehead. Put it on your phone. Store. We know what that word means, don't we? They were to be collecting offerings for these churches in Judea, and in particular the Jerusalem church. They were to store it. If it was food, store it. If it was livestock, store it. As he may prosper, notice at the end of verse 2, so that when I, so that there will be no collecting when I come. I want it there when I get there so that I can collect it and take it with me. I don't want you all to have to be taking it just because I showed up. Now, 2 Corinthians is where we started to do our reading. I asked, and you may have done it, you may not have, but I want you to see 2 Corinthians 8 because this also is so important here. We want you to know, because it's again talking about the same offering, and it's going to apply to missions here in just a minute. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. Those are the Philippian churches, okay? That's from the book of Philippians. And those Philippians knew what they were doing. Verse 2, for in a severe test of, what's it say there? A severe test of? Can't fail. Can't fail. Wow. What happened? How come I got it so good here? Has it, did all the signs been doing that? No, just no. Affliction. The severe test of affliction. Okay? Their abundance of joy. The whole theme of Philippians was about joy. It's mentioned in four chapters 13 times. Joy, joy, joy. But they had afflictions and joy. 
I know about you because when I get afflictions, I don't have a whole lot of joy. In fact, I have a lot of complaining in my afflictions. But they didn't. In the severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on the world. They were giving away more than the Corinthians. And they didn't have it to give. This is where faith, promise, missions come into play. And it's really a form of grace giving. For they have, all these guys on TV talk about giving when you don't have it to give and you give to my ministry and God's going to bless you. I was in a church right down the road a few years ago and the pastor said, if you will start giving to this church, you'll get a new boat. You'll get a new car and a new house. I wish I could tell you I'm making that up. He literally said it twice on both times. Right down the road here. That's not what Paul is saying here. He's saying that because of the persecution, God was able to see the abundance of their heart. Not much different than what happened to those Jews who got captured in Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar. And they began to praise God in great ways. And Isaiah said they were going to do it. And he was right. Because verse 3 notices, For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, on their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. That's, a, that's at Jerusalem. They were helping them. And this not as we expected, but they gave themselves first, I love verse 5, mm -hmm. to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. You're not just paying off God here. It's not just, I've made a promise here, and I'm going to do this. What I'm going to suggest in the meeting is that we, come October, when we start this little coffee shop ministry, that we decide, with no names, we're going to fill out a card, and what we can do for the most part of 2025 in the area of those who are in the darkest regions of the world of the gospel. And it's going to be a personal commitment of faith that you have. And the idea would be is that you would do it with joy and that you will do it abundantly. Because that's what Paul said these people did for people in the Holy Land that they didn't even know who they were, but they were thankful for what they had been given. And they were able to do that even though they didn't have it to do. Verse 6, according as we urged, who does it say? Somebody. Somebody named their child Titus. How terrible. I couldn't wait to get to that verse, mm -hmm. Susan, just so you could see this. That as he started, so he should complete among you, Corinthians, this act of what? This ain't tithing. This is above giving the tithe. And it is mercy giving for those who you don't even know about. They were doing it for famine, but they were also going to do it so the churches could be strengthened because the churches in Judea were going to handle it, and it was very important. This was the one condition that the apostles put on these Gentiles. That was it. They didn't tell them they had to be at church. They didn't even tell them they had to tithe. All they said was, please give relief to the saints who were in Judea. And Paul said, I'll make that commitment. Because now notice verse 7. But as you excel in everything in faith, Corinthians, in speech, they were all about the gifts. They all like to teach. In knowledge, they all like that. In earnestness and in our love for you, excel in this act of grace also. Instead of faith promise, we could have called it grace giving. And it's organized in the churches because that's important. I say this not as a command. Grace is not a command. It's what you do because of love. To prove the earnestness of your love to others that it might be genuine. Y'all see what it says in verse 8? You're proving the earnest of your love in genuine extending of grace, which is unmerited. It's above and beyond. It's willing to say, you're not some evangelist on TV asking, saying, I know you can't pay the rent this month, but you give it to me and God will give you the rent. I don't know that God's going to give you the rent. But I do know this. God has promised when you do this out of grace for those who are without, and there's no greater without than the gospel, and you give. And it may not just be, you say, I can't even find one red cent. That's okay. You give in the ways that God's led you to give in the abundance way. Some people brought sheep. Some brought goats. Some brought ducks. They did what they did. 
I, I used to talk to missionaries in Africa. They would say, you know that passage in the Psalms that says, I've never seen my people forsaken of food and begging bread? He goes, I've seen God's people forsaken bacon and brew. And they only until other churches chipped in and they brought livestock to feed them. So it can happen. Faith promise giving is what this is all about. And it starts there in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. It doesn't end there, by the way. It's in all other places. Let me be honest. Hannah did faith promise. When she, she couldn't have a child, she said, I'm going to give that child to the Lord. And think about who she gave it to. Hannah had Samuel, the first great prophet of Israel, not the last, and she gave it to old Eli, who was a cad. In fact, Samuel probably got into heaven because of Eli, because of the fact that he was, he was allowing so much evil going on, it was doubtful whether he even believed in Jehovah, and Samuel helped him as a young lad. But Hannah was the one who was praying, and Eli was the one who thought she was drunk while she was praying at the altar. You see what I'm saying? How great is that? That's grace giving, isn't it? She was willing to do it with her own child. Who did it for his only son? The greatest grace giving there ever was. Even her husband said, this is crazy. Why would you do this? God gave me that son. And I'm going to give it back to him. And that's grace giving. That's faith promise. And Samuel became a great missionary to Israel and the world. Faith promise giving is really what this is about. Now, guys, I want y'all just to see this here. We're not going to see spend any time on this. It's spectacular, okay? It, it, and that's verse 2. It's sacrificial. That's in the middle of, the end of verse 2. This is a list I put together years ago. It's strong giving in verse 3. Mm -hmm. It's powerful, okay? Then... It's stretchability. It goes in a glass when you didn't think it was much. It's that little redwood seed, and it's just going and going and going. As a result of that, number five, from verse five, if I can get to it, it's underneath number one, it's sanctioned by God. And it's spiritual service, just like Romans chapter 12 would be there. And when we get to October, we're going, to, we're going to enhance this a little bit more, but I'm just giving you a taste today. And then as a result, it's very submissive, verses 5 and 6, and then it is seamless. It is truly going forth with a flow of God. This is faith, promise, giving. And it's what God wants us to do. It's the greatest test of your faith to let go of what you think is yours. It wasn't in the first place anyway. And it's acting on faith. So now you can't be crazy and say, Lord, okay, I'm going to give 400 I had a friend who was in a church that I was in. He said, I'm going to give God $400 a week. And he didn't have a job for missions. No. you got to have some reasonable understanding of what it is that you can give. And there was a lot that he could give. I will tell you, when you look at what was essential for eating and living and what's not. Um, Sally, them bear claws, those apple fritters, they're so good. And I'm not saying we can't never have them, but they're running four bucks a piece. And I'm not saying that's a good point. What would four bucks do to a place over in India? And I'm not saying that, Sally. My waistline is saying it. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what I want you to see more than anything else is really verse 2. And we've got a key on to that. We're going to go. In a severe test of affliction. Where is it that you can have? And it may be some form of persecution that you might see with family or employers or even, God forbid, our government as it's happening now. It's like it is around the world. But it's a severe test of affliction that you need to see. If you have any addictions, give them up. If you have anything that you're willing to say, Lord, this is yours and I am walking with you. The abundance of joy will come into play and the extreme poverty that you had will be overflowed with a wealth of generosity. 
where God, I'm not saying he's going to put a mountain load of bear claws in there, but he's going to take care of it to where that taste won't even be around anymore. And I do love them bear claws. So I'm preaching more to me than I am you. But Gary, I saw had one today too, didn't he? I'm just we split it. You split it? We split it. That's missions giving then, we right? Split, we split. Amen. We split a half a one. So that's the spectacular stuff. giving that has to be done. What we're looking at is what's essential and what is non-essential. And to get into this area of grace, it's not something you brag upon. But I've seen churches that only ran 100 people were given millions of dollars a year to missions. That's amazing to me. So the, so the formula here is the, t is the test of affliction that you add abundant joy to and your extreme poverty and as a result you get a wealth of generosity. <clears throat> that's, that's grace giving that these TV guys aren't saying, isn't it? Mm. You're giving it to the places. And I'm not saying that all of them are, are illegitimate. I think there might be one or two, but I don't see, in fact, the ones that I see that are legitimate are the ones that aren't asking for money. Right. They're just allowing God to work. Mm -hmm. But I saw a man in Louisiana preaching that if I said his name, you know, he said, if we don't get $5 million, we're off cable. He said it this week. The internet's free, guys. We're going to be on the internet today. Not going to cost a penny. Cables, exp TV's expensive. And he was asking for $5 million to keep his ministry going. His TV ministry. And this is what we need to see more than anything else. That God wants us to be in his program of giving that flows. Because notice this. The point is this, chapter 9. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will reap bountifully. And that's not houses or cars or boats. It means in life itself, the life-giving force of the Spirit, you're going to be reaping. You know what that means? That means the circles of your family and your loved ones and your friends can be closed and you will be seeing them in heaven. Is there anything greater than that? We've seen so many walk away from the faith. We need to get in faith promise giving just for this alone. It's not material. Because notice verse 7, each one, this is chapter 9 now, 2 Corinthians, the very next chapter, must give as he has decided in his heart. So we're going to ask that you make this. We believe this is what we should do. Not, at, not reluctantly or under compulsion. Pastor's not going to care. It's God that we're giving to. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Whew. How beautiful is that? If that? I don't even have to preach that. Just read it one more time, Tyler. Verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. That's what he wants us to do. Now I want to close with this. Just so you guys can see this. We'll go back to this in days to come. Faith will increase. But Haggai in the Old Testament talks about this. If you sow much and you've harvested little, you eat but you never have enough. You drink but you never have your fill. Haggai chapter 1. He's because they're in their sin. You clothe yourselves but no one's more. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. It's because the Jewish nation had got so self-absorbed. When you hear all the type of ministry that's going on, all the protests that we're having, all the false theology, things we've been talking about for weeks on end, it's me, 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 me. We're constantly in need. You're never going to solve the homeless problem because all you can do is think about yourself. And that's what's happening to this country. We are what it says at the end of verse 6. We earn our wages. And we put them into a bag with holes. Hmm. I was carrying out a hundred dollars with me to go to the to the True Value Hardware Shop. Mind me, I was going down the stairs. I was in a hurry. We had a leak, and it was bad. And I knew I had to get the part that had, which we didn't have. I'm flying. I had the hundred dollars and twenties in my pocket, and the next thing you know, the wind was blowing up. You know, we had a little uh, uh, northern come in. It was nice and cool. It's gonna be kind of that way this coming week. The bill started flying off and going down the stairs running. 
and uh, it scared me half to death. I think that's what's happened to us spiritually, is that we have lost so many of the blessings. What happens in the Old Testament physical, I did get the 220 back, by the way. I was afraid some resident was going to come in and stomp on that. I lost that two years ago. I was like, oh, my goodness. Here's what we need to see, though. Malachi closes out the Old Testament was simply saying in chapter 3, last chapter in Malachi, bring your full tithe. And, and this is tithing, which is a suggestion in the New Testament. It's a principle. I believe that grace giving should be over that, but you believe you are this tithe. You're retired. You really don't have the tithe coming in anyway. But notice the key here to the storehouse. Paul said that same thing in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. What you lay in store. The church, it was the tabernacle and temple in the Old Testament. They brought those things to the, to the, and it was distributed to those who had need, mainly widows and children. The church is to be doing the same thing. We are a clearing house. Helping those physically, yes. We'll talk about that in the meeting. But helping those who are on that map with all that red is what God's called us to do. We are to store this and then release it to the penny, to the people who need it. Well, I may not be able to go to India, but we can find people who will. I can go to Huddle. I can go right across the street. Because we don't have that many red dots in this country, do we? I mean, we don't have any green dot, that many green dots in this country. God's called us. I'm going to ask as we close out that you make a promise. We are going to be asking that you fill out a commitment card. It won't have your name on it. Then we'll collect it and get an idea of what we can budget for for the next year. But I am going to ask this morning that you would go back to 2 Corinthians 8, 9, and 10 and read it again. And then ask yourself, can you be a sending missionary? Versus, and I was going to go back to Isaiah 2, but I'm not. I just want you to see this. The mark of a great church isn't the seeding capacity. It's the sending capacity. And that's what the church at Antioch, who got blessed beyond measure in Acts chapter 13, not so much the church in Jerusalem, or the church in Corinth. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. We're thankful for the power of the gospel that's affected each one of our lives, Lord. We're green dots. We have to go from the Holy Spirit. We don't have the stock of the red. But Lord, there are so many people around us in our area, in our Jerusalem, in our Judea, in and around Samaria, our spiritual Samaria here in Texas. Lord, they're lost. May we first see that as first fruits and our evangelism must be real and it must be serious. And may we quit thinking about our own lives and may we be willing to put our lives aside because we know that our lives will be so much better in the kingdom. But right now, Lord, we are not in this kingdom. We are in Satan's domain, and we are called to serve. And Lord, the things that we've talked about for Friday nights, the thing that we've talked about in outreach isn't to build this church, Lord. It is to see the kingdom fulfilled. And we ask, Lord, that as a result of what happens, it is because we have exonerated the name of God and lifting it up. I pray, Father, that for this little place. And I pray, Father, that we realize that what you can do with a little seed put into our life and our hearts can bring revival to this world on the scale of what Jonah saw, on the scale of what the book of Acts saw. Ultimately, to the great awakening the second great awakening that this country had in the late 1800s. And we've been living off of that way too long now. I pray, Father, that there would be a great awakening to this group right here, right now, in Jesus' name. Amen.